Hi friends, I'm so glad. Hi friends, I'm so glad that you are joining me tonight. I'm gonna give a few of y'all some time to jump in here. Um, welcome to our fourth Facebook Live of the summer. I'm so glad that you've joined me tonight as we finish our um, series on guided reading. This is week four of a four part series and so if you've missed the last three weeks, don't worry. Um, if you are on a desktop computer right now, you can go to the left of your screen and scroll and you will see um, a list of choices and there you can click on videos and you can see all of the Facebook Live videos that we did over the last three weeks. So they're still there and they're still on my Facebook page and you can access them at any time. Um, I also just wanted to say it is a little crazy at my house tonight. Our air conditioner went out and so my hair is up. It's super hot um, and we are just rolling with this. I did not want to leave you guys hanging and I was prepared. So um, let's talk about this. Um, we, in those last three weeks of Facebook Live, we unpacked what happens before kids come to the table, and then we spent two weeks unpacking what is happening with them at the table. Um, and so today we're going to talk about what happens beyond the guided reading table. But before we get started, I want to introduce myself. My name is Amanda Richardson. I blog at MrsRichardsonsClass.com. Um, I was in the classroom for several years before stepping out um, to stay home with my kids and run Mrs. Richardson's class full time. I am super passionate about all things balanced literacy, and so I provide professional development um, for balanced literacy here in Texas. Um, so if you're local, if you're in Houston or the Dallas Fort Worth area in the fall, I'd love for you to join me for some ses sessions. Um, okay, so let's recap the last three weeks of our Facebook lives. For the first week was coming to the table. Um, we talked about everything that happens as you prepare your kids to come to the table. We talked about preparing the kids, um, and that's where I shared a blog freebie, preparing yourself, and then we talked about preparing materials. Um, then we talked about, then the next week we spent talking about what happens at the table. We talked about what the table looks like as my students are there, what's happening at the table, and what is not happening at the table. And that's also when we dug into what a 20 minute guided reading lesson looks like in my classroom. Um, then last week, we talked about guided reading at the table again. That was part two. Um, and we talked about grouping our students, scheduling our groups, and identifying our teaching points. Lots of information was shared there. And as I did that last week, I just really felt like um, it was almost too much to squish into our little Facebook Live. So there are some blog posts that go along with those topics on my blog. Um, and also, feel free to go back and watch them um, because they're on my Facebook page and you can always find the videos that we've done there. Okay, so let's get started. Tonight we're going to explore what happens beyond the table. Um, we're going to talk about supporting our parents um, and we're going to talk about what the other kids are doing. So in my classroom, that means literacy stations and we'll dig into that. So first, let's talk about supporting our parents. Um, I'm not sure about your school or um, what the kids are like and the families are like at your schools. But with the exception of one year, I have always taught at schools that were Title I or were like right on the cusp of being Title I. Um, so many times parents wanted to help, but they just didn't know how. And I mean, and I can relate to that as a parent. Like I'm not an expert. Um, I'm not an expert in French and my daughter um, came home speaking French and like if somebody had given me the tools that would have helped me so much and so as classroom teachers I feel like it's our responsibility to help our to help our parents um, and to help equip them a little bit um, I learned quickly that if I provided the tools for my parents in my classroom um, then they could easily support what I was doing and they would gladly um, lots of times um, they would say to me, I, well, I want to help, but I just don't know what else to do. Um, so here are a few ideas of how I support my parents when it comes to reading and guided reading in our classroom. So the first thing I do is I always send home our guided reading books. Um, in one school I worked at, we the guided reading books that we checked out from a library, like the parent had to sign a form saying that they would care for the books and return them. But in most of my schools, that was not the case. I sent home paper books. Um, and sometimes we would we would just replace them, no big deal. And sometimes we would just say, hey, 
Like you lost your book, you paid 25 cents, not that big of a deal. Um, but it just kind of helped the, the kids learn responsibility too. So and we send home, we always send home guided reading books and I did this every single time. So I would send home the book after they've read it at my table and I always, and I did that because I wanted to set them up for success. If they came to my table and we're like, maybe they're new to the level and we're reading it and it's not really working for them, I can tell it's frustrational, it's too hard, they need to bump back down a level, I'm not gonna send that book home for them because all that's gonna happen is they're gonna go home and they're gonna try to read that to their parent and they're gonna get frustrated. Or they're gonna go home and a parent's not gonna be listening and they really can't read the book anyways so I only send home books that are that they have read with me and that they are successful reading um so I just send them home like in a baggie like this and I think I shared this in a previous Facebook live and usually I just put a label on it um, and then their book goes home in a ziploc bag it's super easy it folds up fits in their folder um and then if the ziploc baggie gets broken or the whole thing gets lost like it's super cheap to replace um, the other suggestion I have, the other tip I have, is to send home books that are on their listening level. Um, think interactive read aloud. When we do an interactive read aloud with our kids, it is definitely not on their independent reading level, but it's on their listening level. Um, so I send home, I, I have not done this, but a friend told me about this, and I thought this was a genius idea. And if I were still in the classroom, I would totally be doing this. So they send home a book that is on the kids' listening level. This is for the parent to read. So the parent has a book to read to the child at night. The kid has a book that they can read to the parent at night. They both read. Um, Again, in my schools, I know that many times parents just didn't have lots of books. Um, I think about the many times that I sent home scholastic book orders and lots of them just didn't order. Um, and, and that's okay. Like, I get that. And so if we can send home books that a parent can read to their child, I think that's super valuable. And then the parent feels like they're doing something to help us. And they are. They're reading to their child. And that is a great thing. Um... I know that as classroom teachers, too, we are on a budget. So the brown bag teacher this summer shared a super awesome tip about how Half Price Books donates boxes of books to classrooms. Yes. So go to your local Half Price Books and tell them you are a teacher and you want, and you want, um, you're interested in getting your free boxes of books. Then... Hopefully, I'm assuming they let you pick them out. You can choose books that you know are going to be on your student's listening level, which is not their instructional reading level. Um, their listening level is something that they can listen to and comprehend, but they can't decode and they can't read. Um, like I said, that's what we do when we do interactive read-alouds. Okay, so pick up books that are on your kid's listening level. Throw them together in the baggie. They might fit in your baggie. They might not. Um... If not, maybe you can use, I know they make like those fancier nylon book bags. Um, I never invested in those, but I think they're awesome. And that would also kind of help protect your book, protect your books. Also, the thing to remember is that if these are free books that are getting donated to your classroom, if they don't return all of the time, then it's okay. And if the child is keeping it at home, well, we want them to keep books at home. We want them to read. So maybe it's something that you send home and they keep it home, or maybe it's something that you send home and then they send back and then you swap out. Um, I would probably swap out the listening level book at least once a week. If you have time, maybe more than once a week. And that also is something that could be neat to have the kids bookshop for. They could pick out their own book too. Um, okay. The next thing, the next idea. So send home the guided reading books, send home um, listening level books for your parents to read aloud to your kids. And then the third tip is to send home guided reading book talk cards. Um, so as I worked on developing my guided reading kits, I was trying to figure out how we could support parents more with guided, more than just sending home the guided reading book. So for each book, I created a simple list of ways that a parent can support their child. Um, while they're reading and then after reading. So like here's my list and it says that it's for the book Play Ball and then it goes with this book and then it has um, it has like 
prompts for the parents to use while the child is reading if the child gets stuck. And then it also has a list of questions for the parent to ask um, to kind of help ch check comprehension at the end. The other reason I think that's valuable is because we want the parents to read and to listen to their kids reading, but we also want them to ask questions because we want the parents to see, hey, you know, sometimes the kid can decode the book, but they can't comprehend the book, which, as we talked about last week, probably means we'd make one of those um, mixed leveled groups and we would target a teaching strategy instead. Okay, so guided reading book talk cards. It could be as simple as like you making a generic one that can go home with lots of your books or you make a generic leveled one. Um, mine and my guided reading kit are specific to the books that are in the guided reading kits. Okay, and then the fourth thing that you can do to support your parents at home um, is, is send home this reading at home handout. And this is a freebie on my blog. Um, so this is something that I made because so many times parents want to know what to do, but they don't know how. So again, it's all about equipping our parents to be successful with their kids, right? Um, so it's little things like let them hold the book as you read. How many times um, do parents hold the book and the parent reads reads the book, which is great that the parent's reading the book. We want the child to be read too, but there's so much value also in a kid who's struggling with reading to holding the book, turning the pages, pointing to words, even those simple concepts about print that can be reinforced at home. So this is a, a list with lots of them. I hope you can see the whole thing um, with lots of things that you can send home to suggest to parents. Um, this would be a great thing to send home at Meet the Teacher Night. Um, if you want to send it home when you start your guided reading, you could do that. Um, or this could be something that you talk about if you have a curriculum night. I know many times our school would have a curriculum night where we would talk about our grade level expectations and the content that we were going to be learning throughout the year. And so this would be something great that you could send home and talk to the parents about then also. Again, this is a freebie on my blog. Um, and when I'm done, I will post the link above. So we have that. Okay. Um, so now that we've talked about how to support the parents after the kids have read at our table, let's talk about what all the other kids are doing as, as you're pulling guided reading groups. If there's one question I get most of the time, this is it. Hey, what are all the other kids doing? I don't know how to keep the other kids engaged. They're in the way. I, you know, like they constantly need help. I don't know what to do. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is that a lot of that comes back to setting those expectations, which we talked about in that very first Facebook Live. Like, we have to set our expectations, and we have to let the kids know, hey, when I'm at my table, you don't bother me except for these three reasons. Um, you, don't, you don't interrupt. You are big. You, you can do this. You can be responsible, that kind of thing. Um, and so I try, when it comes to what I have my other kids do, I... I have um, tried many methods. So I've tried everything from daily five to traditional literacy stations where I am changing things out and making new games and putting in new activities like every single week. Um, and that's what I did my first year of teaching and I like made myself crazy. Um, but then with daily five, um, while I felt like it was great, there were still so many aspects from traditional literacy stations that I felt like were super valuable that my kids were missing out on. Um, and so, and because if I'm just honest, I'm a teacher and I like to have some control um, and that's not how that system works all of the time. So um, I found, ne let, let me also be clear, neither of these systems are bad. They are not bad, they are not like terrible teaching practices, but they didn't work for me. Um, and so I'm going to share what worked for me in my classroom, okay? I don't want anybody to leave discouraged at all. So I did a lot of thinking and I did a lot of reading and I did a lot of testing and just trying different things out in my classroom before I figured out what I wanted. And here are the things that I knew for sure that I wanted. Um, I didn't want to change the stations out every week. I didn't want to spend time teaching a game each week. Um, I didn't want to create more work for myself because it already was enough work writing lesson plans, um, figuring out like when we were going to teach the standards, how we were going to teach them, um, and, and all the other things that come up along with teaching. Um, so I didn't want to create more work for myself. Um, I wanted activities that would keep them busy and engaged for about 20 minutes. 
I wanted there to be a variety of activities. I wanted the activities to build upon themselves each week so that there was something new often, um, but not as a result of me creating something new um, and making a new activity or a new game and putting that in the station. I wanted there to be a rotation um, and I wanted them to have choices at the station, but I didn't want them to have full freedom. So I wanted there to be like some freedom. I wanted them to have the freedom of choice and I wanted them to learn how to make wise choices. Um, but I, I didn't want them to have like full freedom to choose anything and everything. Um, so I ended up with eight stations that I love and that my students have loved also. So he, I'm going to list them off and then we're going to, and then I'll briefly tell you about each of them. Independent reading time, pocket chart, big book, word work iPad or eye touches, um, computer, writing, and listening. So those were the eight stations that I had in my classroom. Um, and I don't think I ever, after I like established my system, I don't think I ever like added something different. This, this was just like my eight that were tried and true and that I loved and that the kids loved and that the kids were successful at too. Um, so I feel like I could spend forever telling you about all of these, um, and we really could dig deep into each of them, um, but I don't think anybody wants to hang around here for three hours. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time telling you about each, because maybe there are stations that you already have in your classroom. Um, maybe you don't know where to begin even, um, but maybe you can leave with some new ideas. And so, independent reading time. Students would go get their book tub, um, and it looked basically like this. Let me take these out. No spiral notebooks were in there. So they would just go get their book tub. And in their book tub, they would have books from their guided reading spot with me and books that they have book shopped for or that I have placed in their tub um, that I knew they would enjoy reading. And then they would also have their song and poem book, which was filled with the shared reading poems that we had learned already, that we had already gone over during the weeks previous. Um, and then each week as we got a new one, we would add to it. Um, so this is great for helping build fluency. So they would always have lots of choices in their book tub. So after they read their guided reading book at my table, it would go home. And when they came back to my table, they would bring that book back. They would get a new book. That old book would then go in their book tub. You see, so my table, home, book tub is how the book would go. Um, and then whenever I was running low on books, I would go, we would all clean out our book tubs and we would go and pull out the books that were too easy for them. And that was a really fun experience for them to work through and them to figure out also. Okay, so that's independent reading. Um, then we did pocket chart. Here they would read old songs or poems from our shared reading time that I had either written on sentence strips um, and I also would hang command hooks on the wall and then I would use those little O-rings, the ones like this. Um, and I would hole punch the songs or the poems from shared reading that I wrote on chart paper and then they would hang, I would laminate them so that they would last and then they would hang on the rings on the 3M hooks on the wall. So when they went to pocket chart, they could read a poem or a song. They always were a poem. Most of the time they were to the tune of a song. I wrote them to a tune of a song. They would go, in, they would be on sentence strips in the pocket chart or they would be um, written on chart paper and they would hang on the wall. So that wall space was kind of large in my room, um, but it worked really great for us. So that was, so that's our pocket chart station. Then the other station is Big Book, um, which also is another extension of shared reading. So one child would get to be the teacher while the others would be the students as they read the Big Book together. And you guys, this was like, Every single kid loved this station because they got to play teacher and everybody loves to play teacher. Um, I liked to put like some prompts on, on a ring and put them in the basket where I held all of the big books because this helped the kid who's being the teacher prompt the kids um, to help retell the story after. They would use the pointer. I would let them use highlight tape, the whole nine yards. They went to town and they loved it. And because we are constantly doing a different poem every week or a, um, a big book, then after we're done with that for the week, then it goes in that station. So things are constantly being added and they constantly are having new choices there. Um, but I'm not doing any other work other than planning my normal lesson plans to provide for those stations. I hope that makes sense. Um, 
Okay, word work is the next station that we would do. They would do word sorts that we would do either in during our guided, during our shared reading time. Um, and of course, anything that they wanted to use to build words. So oftentimes, um, they would start by like building sight words, building their name, building their friends' names, building vocabulary words, whatever it may be, using whatever magnetic letters I put in. And you know, magnetic letters again, but they look different. So hey, the station's new and fun because something different's in there. Um, I liked to write letters on bottle caps of like water bottles. That was a fun one. Paint stirs. I would write the letters at the end of the paint stirs. And so then they were really big and they would like get on the floor and build words with the paint stirs. That was a lot of fun. Um, and then of course, like I said, all of like the word sorts that we had. And I would just put them in a baggie. And then they would all go just in a tub like this at the, st at the station. Um, there also were our sight words that were just on a ring so that those were easily available. And of course they were always available on the word wall too. So any word work activity, um, that we would do as a whole group, like during shared reading, there almost always was some sort of word sort or phonics focus. After we did that, it would go in this bucket as well. So again, I'm constantly adding something new to it every week, but I'm not doing work, um, besides what I'm doing already to plan for my lesson plans. And because I've already done it with them, I'm setting them up for success in this station. Therefore, they're less likely to be a behavior problem because they know how to do these activities um, and they feel successful. Okay, so that's word work. Okay, iPads and eye touches. Um, so my last two years in the classroom, I had the privilege of having these and they were great. Um, so I would just make a folder for different levels of kids and the kids knew and I would organize the apps that way. So the kids knew where they could go in the iPad and what games that they could play. Um, I loved, loved, loved that this was like so easily differentiated um, and that I could, you know, just kind of guide them and help them practice things that they needed to practice even more. Um, so that was awesome. And they would play reading games and word building games, anything that... Um, that aligned with like our literacy standards was free game um, as far as apps went. And then I just put them where they needed to go as far as like for which students they fit best with. Um, okay, then computer. Unfortunately, most of the time, um, my students had to do iStation on the computer, which is a program that our district used. Um, and it wasn't awful, but the kids were required to get a certain amount of minutes every week in this program. So what that meant was not only did they need computer time in the computer lab, but they needed computer time in my classroom. And the easiest thing for me was just to put computer through in the rotation for my workstations. So every kid, every kid would rotate through the computer and do iStation, um, which is reading and phonics. It, it's all literacy based and they would get extra, they would get their minutes that were required for iStation. Um, there were tons of wonderful and awesome um, websites out there that your kids can do on computer, but those were, that's what my kids had to do, unfortunately. Um, so the next station was writing, um, and usually this was free writing. So by the time I introduced the writing station, for the most part, we already had done a couple of weeks of um writer's workshop and so they knew kind of our writing routines our writing expectations um and so i would encourage them to just write about a small moment or write about something we were learning in class um and other times i would throw in a fun writing craft that went along with our science unit and they would just get to work on that during their writing time um, at the writing station so that was great um and then the last station was listening um, i never had a fancy headphone splitter um, but I wish I did. They're like so cheap on Amazon. So at this point, I totally would just get one. Um, but I used books with CDs and my kids all like gathered around a little CD player and they listened and they just knew and I had taught them like this is the volume that we listen to it on. Um, so they would listen to books on CDs. And then there were multiple copies of the books in there. This is like nothing fancy. Um, I got most of them from my Scholastic book order with saved points, um, or I would splurge every now and then, and I would get and I would get um, new books. Um, 
after they listen to the book, then they would fill out a recording sheet. Um, you can grab some free on my blog, um, and I'll put the link above to those as well. I also have played around a little bit with a website called Epic, um, and it's great. It's a lot like Tumble Books, except it's fancier. Um, it's free for teachers, so be sure to check it out. As long as you have devices, um, then your kids are going to be free to do listening. Like if you have extra tablets and stuff, your kids are going to be free to do listening um, really easily and like in various ways besides just like CDs and books. Um, my last year in the classroom, I started to upload my CDs to iTunes. Um, but what happened was I felt like my kids were not, they weren't able to like listen to the right book with the right book and so it was just a mix up at times um so it worked okay for my kids for them to put the cd in press play listen to it um and then of course we have like a whole routine for how many times they listen to it before they fill out the recording sheet yada yada so every every couple of weeks um every week or so i guess i would put in a new book in the listening station so again no work for me it's the same station they know exactly what to do but hey it's new and exciting because i put something new in there um so that's how listening station worked for us so let's talk a little bit about the specifics of launching your stations um when do i begin so i begin introducing literacy stations the first week of school um, with my kindergarten kids, it usually was around day three, but with my first graders, it was the first day if we could fit it in, and if not, it was the second day. Um, I always started right at the beginning. Um, we would start with independent reading because it was really easy for everybody to practice that suit together. I would model what it should look like, what it should sound like, what our classroom environment looks and sounds like, um, and then we would just all practice that together. We would work um, to build up our time. But I never, ever was a crazy person about the classroom being super quiet. Um, case in point, the CD player for the listening station. Kids reading the big book together. Kids reading the um, pocket at the pocket chart station together. It never, ever was super quiet in my classroom. Um, but they also knew that they had to have um, an inside level voice. So... I think it's good and it's valuable for students to talk. That helps build their vocabulary and helps, especially those kinder babies, as there's lots of them are still just developing those language skills. I think it's fantastic um, for them to talk a little bit, but that doesn't mean they have to be yelling. And so as long as you are teaching that with your literacy station expectations, I think you're totally going to be fine. Um, so we would each week I would open a new station. And then beginning week five, I would probably, I usually opened about two stations a week. Um, so how do I organize my stations? That's another question I get. Like, I don't know how I, to, I should organize this or what it should look like. Um, so my students would, would read a rotation chart to find out where they would go each time. And I've done this two ways. So um, my first several years in the classroom, I did it with a pocket chart just like this. It's probably backwards for you guys, but you get the gist. So like here, I would add the kids' names. Um, and then, and there were usually two or three kids per station, usually three, sometimes more, but usually three. Um, and then they went to this station first, this station second, this station third. Um, and then I would rotate the kids' names down. So they just looked for their name each time. And that was less book, less cards for me to move than moving all of these right here, okay? So the station icon had the name, and then each station also would have, like, this was our listening station tub, and so it had the same icon as that matched the board. Does that make sense? And also then in the classroom, because like some stations didn't have a tub or didn't have a basket, so I would label that area in our classroom. So like if I had a writing table, I would label the writing table um, with the station icon so that they could match those. So the goal was to go to three stations because my goal at my guided reading table was three groups. So sometimes they didn't get to the third station and they just knew if they didn't get to their third station, we go to new stations tomorrow. Um, if not, I felt like I was t always playing catch up. And so it was just like, hey, it's okay. We go to new stations tomorrow and we just keep moving. Um, so that's with 
that was, oh, that was one rotation board. The other rotation board I used was on my interactive whiteboard, which was probably my favorite because it was just super simple for me to open that file, drag those names down to rotate them, and be done. Um, so that was a super easy one. And then it also would just stay up the whole time we did stations. If you don't have a um, interactive whiteboard, uh, the pocket chart also worked fabulous. Um, the interactive whiteboard was just, just took up less wall space um, because the interactive whiteboard itself was already taking up wall space. So I didn't have to take up wall space with my pocket chart. So for the stations that needed tubs to house items, I really liked these tubs. Um, I got mine many, many years ago at the Dollar General store. Um, I know Dollar Tree has lots of great tubs. These tubs lasted me a really long time. I haven't had to replace one of them at all. Um, they're by Sterilite, and there is a link to them on my blog um, if you want a link to the exact tubs that I have that have been awesome. Um, the tub, again, gets a table that gets a label, not a table, gets a label that matches the rotation, the rotation chart. Um, so, as I said, every station looks different for how I introduced it. I wrote a little guide that explains everything in detail. So it has pictures of the stations, it has things to get started, um, it lists all of the things you need, it has the rotation cards, um, and it explains like this is what the station looks like at the beginning of the year for me, and this is what it looks like as the year goes on. Um, so that is a product that's for selling my Teachers Pay Teachers store. If you just go to Teachers Pay Teachers and search launching literacy stations, it should be the first product that pops up for you. Um, and if not, you can go straight to my store and you can find it easily. And my store is Amanda Richardson. Um, but before we end tonight, first of all, I wanted to tell you all, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I wanted to tell you about a little Facebook group that we've created that is all about balanced literacy. There are over 300 of us in this group already, um, and we are there to share and learn together as we head into the new school year. You can find that group by searching Balanced Literacy with Mrs. Richardson um, on the Facebook search, or if you're on my Facebook page on a desktop, you can go to the left over there where I led you earlier to the videos link you can go to groups and when you click on groups then you will see the group and you can request to join it's going to prompt you and ask you um, what grade level you teach but that's just so I can have a good understanding of the grade levels um, of the people that are in our group and so we can lead the discussion that way so it is a great place people are asking questions um, I shared my schedule because people are like people have Asked me many times, like, I don't know what my schedule needs to look like in a balanced literacy classroom. So I shared my schedule from a few years ago. So there, it's just a great, great place for us to collaborate, share ideas, ask questions, learn from one another. Um, because I know that I still have lots to learn. And so, um, yeah, if you want to join that group, we would be happy to have you. So I'm going to scroll up a little bit and see. I know that several of y'all asked some questions and see what I can answer. Um, and then I will finish up with your questions that I don't answer live. I will get to them tonight um, when I get to a house that has air conditioning. I am so sorry about this, you guys. Um, okay, so one of my favorite apps during iPad time. Oh my gosh, Emily, I wish that I could just spit one off right now. A lot of the times, um, and this was almost, this is going on four years ago, because it's been four years, that one of the apps that my kids loved was Teach Me and then whatever grade level. So Teach Me First, Teach Me K, but there's so many more apps out there now that are fabulous and that are great. Um, that would be a great question to ask in that balanced literacy group. What are some favorite apps that you use? Um, um, sticking stuff on the walls. Yes, the 3M hooks. Nicole, the 3M hooks, like I could put on the wall in my school that said no staples on the wall, no anything on the wall. We used marvelous tape, which I got at the teacher supply store, and I used 3M hooks for everything. And it came off the wall at the end of the year and left nothing. It was it worked beautifully. It worked perfect. Um, so, some yes. Do they do all eight stations in one day or over the course of a week? Over the course of a week. And some of them they're going to do twice. And some of them they're going to do three times. It's just going to depend. Um, but, yes, they do do three stations a day, Cindy. Um, 
<laughs> yes, Frederica, you did see a rug in my basket, um, but not for listening station. So I'll tell you a little bit more about these rugs. These rugs are from the Target Dollar Spot. Um, not recently, but for a long time, they would put seasonal ones out. So at Thanksgiving, turkey ones. So these, um, this shark one and this octopus one were like from summertime. Um, but they put them in their dollar spot and I would use them. I would throw them in a basket along with um, a few stuffed animals sometimes and they would be our reading spots. So when my kids did independent reading, they would grab their rug if they chose to have one and then they would find their spot in the classroom but they had to stay on their rug. That just really helped them stay in their space and not like be rolling around the floor or like playing bear and crawling under the tables. You know, sometimes they can be bananas. So the reading rugs, or I use these as reading rugs. So yes, there is a rug in my basket. Um, Grace, if you missed anything, don't worry. This is going to be posted on my page and so you can just catch the replay. Um... Nola, yes, I would do two 15-minute sessions instead of one 30-minute session. So, okay, well, I hope you all have a wonderful night. Um, this is the end of our guided reading series for now, but in two weeks, I hope to come back um, with more Facebook Lives. I, I'm tossing around the idea of really digging into and showing you all of the components of my guided reading kit because I'm getting lots of questions about that. Um, and I also want to talk about some back-to-school interactive read-alouds. So, um... Nicole, if you have suggestions or if anybody else has suggestions, please feel free to message me because I want to help you. And so if there's anything that you um, are looking for specifically and that I could, you know, discuss with you guys, I would love to do that. So I hope you all have a great night and I will talk to you later. Bye.